So the aim of this uh, meeting is to help clarify any question you may have on COVID-19 uh, vaccinations, especially for 12 to 17 year olds. As some of you may be aware, as of 17th October, nine in 10 individuals aged 18 and over have been vaccinated with at least one dose or, and more than eight, and also more than eight in 10 individuals aged 18 and over have been vaccinated with both doses of COVID vaccine. And from 28th September, vaccinations started to be rolled out to all 12 to 15 year olds following the government accepting the UK chief medical officer's recommendation to extend the vaccine offer to everyone in this age group, which is indeed good news. We are, however, we, we, are, we are aware that parents and carers may have questions, thus this forum. So if you have questions, please put in the chat box and we'll try and answer them. Um, if we are unable to answer them today, uh, we will definitely make sure that they are attended to and we put them on the council's website. So welcome again, everyone. And we will start this evening's um, meeting with a presentation from two presenters. And also after that, you will have opportunity to ask questions, that any question on COVID vaccination that you may have. And then I'll give them opportunities again to give final statements at the end of the meeting, and then we would close. So please help me welcome this evening uh, to renowned people. Dr. Vijay Naya is a renowned uh, GP at the King Street Surgery in Bedford, and he has been in Bedford for over 30 years. And in the past year, he has been very much involved in delivering the COVID vaccine to the community. Thank you very much for joining us this evening, Dr. Naya. We also have with us Dr. Hian Brown, who is currently the Chief Officer for Public Health Bedford Borough, and he has worked in the local authority public health team for 10 years. And before that, he worked as a researcher in the School of Public Health at Imperial College London, where he completed his PhD in epidemiology. Dr. Brown is a qualified public health consultant and is a fellow of the Faculty of Public Health. So welcome Dr. Brown and Dr. Naya, and it's really great to have you with us this evening. So I'm going to call on Dr. Brown to start with his presentation. Dr. Brown, please. Thank you, Boye. Um, so I'm just going to say a few words first about the COVID situation in Bedford and um, the, the, the role of the vaccination programme, particularly uh, with respect to uh, uh, children and young people who are now eligible, as Foyer has already said. So this first chart just shows the number of daily confirmed cases of COVID-19 uh, over the last 12 months, um, with the most recent days of data on the right-hand side. And you can see that blue line through uh, the darker blue line there is the average over seven days. So you can see that the average uh, seven day rate of COVID infections uh, in the middle of October reached a peak that was higher than at any time since mid January 2021, when we were experiencing a significant wave of infections as a result of the, the Kent variant, which was subsequently known as the Alpha variant, which caused a huge number of, of hospitalizations and sadly deaths as well. Um, in Bedford. So our case rates now are, are, are similar to they were as, as we were coming out of that uh, big wave of infections over the winter period last year. Thanks. What is different now though is who is being infected. So um, this time around we're seeing many more infections in young people because um, the rest of the adult population has already been offered the COVID-19 vaccination, so the, the rates of infection are much lower in those groups. And this graph shows the rate of infection in different age groups. So the top line that you can see there is the rate of infection in 11 to 18 year olds. And you can see that in the middle of October, uh, 1,400 per 100,000 of our young people were uh, infected in a seven day period. And that's 1.4% that, that's, that's of young people had COVID-19 in a seven day period. Uh, which I think is quite astonishing in, among those 11 to 18 year olds. When we break it down further, the rate in our 11 to 15 year olds is even higher. So two and a half percent of our 11 to 15 year olds at one point had, had COVID-19 in seven days, which is quite astonishing. Um, and we can see that what's happened since then, we've had the half term break and we can see that the case rate has come down in that age group. 
We can also see that it's come down as well uh, in the naught to tens, the green line that's directly below that line. But unfortunately, we have seen the cases rising in some of our older adult groups. And that's a concern because that means then um, we may get increased hospitalizations. And so we can see the bottom line on the chart there is our over 60s. And we can see that on the 21st of October, there were around about 100 for 100,000 over 60s with COVID-19. And by the end of October, that had risen to 200 per 100,000. And indeed, it's, it's, it's now looking like it might even go a little bit higher than that. And that sadly, despite vaccination, means we will see more hospitalizations and potentially more deaths. We're also seeing rising case rates in younger working age adults as well. And you can see the, 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 the reddish line there, the 23 to 39 year olds, uh, has risen in the last week or so. And we also see very high rates in our 40 to 59 year olds at the moment as well, the orange line. So the picture is changing at the moment. We had a picture at the start of this term of high rates in our uh, children, young people, and we're now seeing that translating into high rates in the rest of the community as well. Thank you. And I mentioned that that's likely to have an impact on the hospital situation, and that is unfortunately what we are seeing. So uh, Bedford Hospital, uh, this is the data from yesterday, they had 54 patients um, uh, in, the, in the hospital with diagnosed COVID-19. Uh, the majority of whom were diagnosed in the community and then subsequently admitted to the hospital. Most of those are over 60. Uh, most of those are vaccinated, but we know that when you have high numbers of people who are vaccinated in the population, then you still expect to see the highest numbers of cases among those people. It's a bit like why we see uh, the highest number of road traffic accidents and deaths in people who are wearing seatbelts. That's because the vast majority are wearing seatbelts. Um, so this is the same effect. So that is concerning and Bedford Hospital now has uh, two COVID wards open and they're looking at opening a third ward to meet the demands. So that, that's, that's changing quite rapidly and quite concerningly. In terms of the school situation, in the first half of this school term, we had more than 2,000 children, young people aged 5 to 17 test positive. And each of those children had on average eight days of school uh, off because they, were, because they uh, were isolating at home. They may have received some remote education during that time if they were well enough, but that means that they missed nearly 18,000 days of face-to-face -face teaching in their schools. So um, unfortunately, although we've, we're no longer isolating entire classes, uh, this is still really disrupting uh, education. We've had 37 of our educational settings have had an outbreak uh, in at least one of their year groups. Many of them have had outbreaks in multiple year groups. And that includes 22 of our primary schools and 11 of our secondary schools. And as a result of this, uh, the Director of Public Health has written to all the schools and parents and carers, uh, setting out some additional advice and steps that they should be taking uh, to reduce the spread of COVID-19 among children and young people. And as part of that request, we've asked that parents and carers support young people aged 12 and 17 to have their COVID vaccination, because that will help to reduce the transmission that we're sadly seeing in our schools and in our colleges. So I wanted to give a few uh, figures around the vaccination programme. Uh, these numbers look a bit different to the numbers that Boya mentioned at the start, and that's because um, the, 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 uh, the population numbers uh, on which they're based are, are different. So there's different ways of calculating the proportion of the population who have had their vaccine. Uh, you can use um, Office for National Statistics data, or you can use NHS data, uh, these numbers are based on the NHS data. I believe FOIA's numbers were based on the Office for National Statistics data. So, uh, but, but the good news is that our most vulnerable populations, um, the vast majority, our older adults have now had uh, two doses of the vaccine. So 85% of 50 plus uh, to 59 year olds have already had their vaccine. And it's much, much higher in the older age groups. Um, more than half of our adults aged 18 to 29 have had two doses now as well, which is fantastic news. Um, We've been vaccinating 16 to 17 year olds for, for several weeks now, and we can see that uh, nearly 60% of those have had their vaccine. And um, the uh, 12 to 15 vaccine program, which started in schools, as you know, and has subsequently uh, been offered through the national booking system as well, uh, we've vaccinated uh, nearly two and a half thousand. And in fact, that number I checked again today, these slides I did yesterday, and I checked that number again today, and it's now over 25% of them already have their jab and we're still uh, visiting all the schools and, and getting that as high as possible. So in terms of the rationale for this, um, the UK's chief medical officers have all agreed that whilst COVID is thankfully mild and, you, and sometimes has no symptoms at all in young people, it can still be very unpleasant for some. And one dose of the vaccine they've concluded will provide 
a good level of protection against severe illness and hospitalization for young people. Uh, so as well as protecting the individual, it will also protect them from having to have time off school and it will help to reduce the spread in school. It will also help to protect the teachers and the staff in the settings as well, who may be more vulnerable. Uh, the medicines regulator, the main HRA, they've confirmed that the vaccine is safe and effective in this age group. And they've reviewed data from around the world, uh, including clinical trial data and safety data. Uh, and they've, they've, they've concluded it is effective. And this vaccine has been used in young people uh, in their millions around the world now. Um, the UK government at the moment, on the basis of the chief, uh, chief medical officers, is only offering one dose, but it may well be that when they look at the data, they choose to offer the second dose at a later point. And um, the, the chief medical officer for England has suggested that probably won't happen any time before the spring. Um, in terms of how to get the vaccination, um, all of the 16 and 17 year olds have all been offered the vaccine directly, one dose, and they can have that at a walk-in centre locally, or, or they can now book online through the national booking system as well if they prefer to have an appointment. Um, all of our 12 and 15 year olds are being offered a first dose through the schools-based vaccination programme and parents and carers will have received uh, a consent form from their schools and a letter explaining how that works. Uh, and we know that there are some people uh, and some children who, who won't be able to access the vaccine through their schools and the school age immunisation service, just like they would for any other school age vaccination, will make special arrangements, uh, for example, for home educated children, uh, those who are in secure facilities, uh, those potentially who are in, in a college setting rather than a school setting. Also, we know that because a lot of children have had COVID-19 infections and are not able to be vaccinated for 28 days, there are a number of students who may not have been able to get vaccinated when uh, the service visited the school. And so mop-up sessions are also being arranged for them and the schools will be in touch directly about those. Um, I'm also really, really pleased that 12 to 15 year olds and their families can now book directly through the national booking system as well. So you can book an appointment and you can get your vaccine at the, for example, Mountain Heights uh, Centre in Bedford. Uh, so there's no need to wait for the school or if you missed the school opportunity, then you can, you can book directly in through that as well. We're trying to make it as easy as possible. I've included some links here and we will make sure that um, we can uh, share those uh, with you all, uh, information about uh, questions and answers you may have. Uh, we've got information that's formatted specifically for young people as well. So it's very, very important uh, that, that parents and carers have conversations with their children about this, about what they would like and what their children would like and any questions they have. And there are resources there to support those conversations. Um, we've got information from the CECG website there about local vaccination centers. And also, uh, we've got information on how to book through the national booking system as well. And that was all I was going to say for now. Um, I will, uh, if Emily minds, stop showing my slides, thank you. I'll hand over to, to, to Dr. Nayar. Uh, and, uh... Hello, thank you, Ian, for those uh, excellent slides. Um, Ian's covered a huge amount of information there. Um, and. I don't want to overload you with some information, but I'll just pick out a couple of points. Um, the first thing I would say is that we know that 40 to maybe 70% of children may not have any symptoms with, when they get COVID. However, they can still pass the virus on. So they can still pass it on to uh, peers at school, but they can also pass it on to household contacts. And that's why we're seeing the numbers that we're seeing. If children do get COVID, it tends to be mainly fever, headache, but in fact, it can be lots of other symptoms like any other cold, runny nose, sore throat, might even get diarrhea, muscle aches and so forth. So if they have any of those symptoms, it's really important if we can get them tested to see if they have got COVID because then they can be self-isolated early. Um, so COVID, in general, lasts around on average six days in children. Uh, and if you compare that to other kind of coughs and colds and things like that, that usually just lasts two or three days. So it does last longer when you do get COVID uh, in children. And as I said, fever and headache are the, are the kind of most common symptoms. Now, COVID is slightly different to other coughs and colds and other respiratory infections, because actually you're infectious before your symptoms come out. And that's why it's such a clever little virus. 
So it gives you the virus, it makes you spread it out before you even know you've got it, before the symptoms come out. So picking up and doing those lateral flows in people who are not symptomatic is important because you might even re not realize at that stage, actually I've got COVID and I'm passing it on. If you think about other coughs and colds, other respiratory viruses we get, you're usually infectious when you've got the symptoms. But as I said, with COVID, it happens when you haven't got the symptoms. So that's why we, we are uh, worried when people, you know, are not symptomatic in schools and so forth to do the lateral flows and keep checking. So what's the solution? Well, we haven't got a particular solution, but there's a suite of things that help. Of course they do. We all know about spacing. We know about washing hands. We know about masks. And I think it's good practice to keep all those things going. And as Ian said, schools have given more information recently about wearing those masks in that school environment. But I think the whole community, we still need to be careful. The numbers are high out there. So we should be uh, taking precautions as much as we can in terms of contact with people and wearing masks when we're out in the community. Things that we got used to in the summer, and I think we just may have got out of the habit, but I think we just need to, to think about that as the winter months approach. Because over winter, we're gonna have other viruses and infections, uh, especially flu coming along. Uh, and so alongside the COVID vaccine, let's not forget the flu vaccine. Please, when you're offered that, and we're offering it to, to children, uh, primary school, adolescents, and we give them a nasal spray over two years, uh, and also all the adults that we're offering over 50 and those with underlying conditions, have your flu jab as well, because having flu and COVID together is not a good combination uh, and causes illness. So what does the vaccine do? Well, the COVID vaccine reduces your chance of having a positive COVID test by three times, which is pretty good, really. And, and just as a kind of average figures I'll give you, it kind of reduces your chance of catching COVID by around a half. It reduces your chance of giving COVID to someone else by probably a half. And it reduces your chance of getting long COVID by about a half. So that's pretty good figures for us uh, and gives us good protection. And if you've been double vaccinated and there is a chance of reinfection, so we do see people getting it again, it's really important uh, to remember that it, it reduces the symptoms you get, so you'll get a milder form of it. But the big thing the vaccine does, and that's its purpose, is to stop severe illness, stop us being admitted to hospital, and stop high rates of mortality that we saw earlier on before we had the vaccine. Uh, so it's really effective. Um, and giving it to children, for us now, we started this program slightly behind Europe, and therefore you'll see their rates are better than ours now. We're catching up and it's really important that we can get our children vaccinated as well. So I'm gonna stop there to give as much time as we can for questions and discussion. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Naya. And thank you also, Dr. Brown, for the um, data shared and also the insights on importance of having the COVID vaccine and also the importance of um, allowing children 12 to 17 year olds to have the vaccine as well. Um, we already have some questions in the chat box and please, if you have questions, kindly um, write your questions or post them in the chat box. So we have some questions here. There's one I believe for Dr. Brown about age breakdown of recent hospitalization. Sorry, I'm not on me tonight. Yes, um, so we, we don't have that data readily available to us, but I, I, I do know, for example, at the moment, um, as I said at the start, that um, the majority of our cases, the biggest age group affected at the moment in the hospital is over 60. Uh, and thankfully, uh, we have very few cases uh, in children, young people who are hospitalised, and that has been the case uh, throughout the pandemic. But uh, because of the very small numbers involved, we can't uh, disclose those for Bedford. Thank you very much. And there's also another question, I believe, 
but it's for you, Dr. Brown, it's on data. So where can we see the long-term data for children having the jabs? Sure, um, I, I think we might need to put some links to resources um, up on the website at the end of this because it's very difficult. But um, so um, there's information from monitoring by the US, um, they're called the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, and they've studied the effects of the Pfizer vaccine uh, in, um, in 12 to 17 year olds, for example, uh, and, and observed rates of side effects and things like that, for example, since they've been rolling that out in that age group. Uh, we don't have long term data yet because obviously the, the program hasn't been going that long, but we have no reason to expect there to be any long term effects. And in fact, we know that from the history of all the vaccines that we deliver at the moment, if there are going to be effects, they tend to be within the first couple of months. What we also know is that these vaccines break down very quickly in the body. So the, the messenger RNA, which delivers the instructions to the body to make the, the proteins that the body then recognizes as part of the virus and creates an immune response, that messenger RNA breaks down within a couple of days. And the proteins that it produces, they also break down, we think, within a couple of months. But there's no evidence at all that those things will stick around in the body or cause any long-term damage. And we are, and the government, and, 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 and through clinical trials, we're monitoring uh, those side effects there is the yellow card scheme where people are asked to report any side effects that they have uh, and they're monitoring the rates of very mild moderate and severe side effects and we'll continue to do that for a very long time to come uh, thank you very much for that i think there's a follow-on question um also on that someone is interested still in whether or not there is you know there are long-term effects on children and also are there alternatives to needles Maybe I ask Dr. Naya to take that question. So, so again, we don't know all the long-term effects, but all the evidence currently is, is saying, no, if there are any effects, they're going to happen in the first few days. In terms of uh, nasal, well, we already have a nasal spray version for the flu vaccine, and there are various uh, 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 institutions working on uh, nasal um, sprays for the COVID. It won't be for a while. Uh, they're still in the early stages of development. But of course, that is one of the developments being looked at, especially for children. Thank you very much. Dr. Brown, do you want to add to that at all? Okay, great. Thank you. So there's a question around um, testing. So the question is uh, about, is it apparently public health England told children under 10 to stop doing lateral flow tests. Is that right? My six-year-old was doing them until school advised not to. Dr. Brown? Yes, so um, when uh, the lateral flow test was first used uh, in schools uh, and started at the start of the year, uh, the advice was that they should only be used in uh, children aged 11 and over. Um, we've received an update to that advice uh, since the start of this term and uh, Public Health England, which is now, of course, the UK Health Security Agency, are now advising that lateral flow tests can be used in younger children uh, so long as the parents feel confident and comfortable to help them uh, and, and do the nasal swabbing. Because the good news is now that the test that you will receive if you, if you book, a, if book a pack of tests online or if you pick them up from a pharmacy, that they will be only the nasal swab only. So there's no need to do a throat swab, which is the most unpleasant part of, of doing the swabbing. So it's now possible uh, to use lateral flow tests on, on younger children. We are not advising uh, that routinely at the moment, but uh, as a parent, uh, you, can, you can absolutely choose to do that. We have changed our advice to schools now. So what we're saying to schools is if there is a COVID case in your household and you have a child who would otherwise be going to school uh, because they don't have any symptoms, they're free to go to school. We are asking uh, parents to, to uh, do a lateral flow test on that child every day because we know that uh, the risk of transmission from somebody else in the household is very, very high. And certainly schools have expressed to us that they're seeing uh, cases in siblings, for example, when they know that a sibling is already positive. So we are saying for children, particularly in key stages two and above, so that's year three and over, uh, we're now advising lateral flow tests if there is a positive case in your household so that the children can go into school uh, you know, uh, with some measure of safety, knowing that they're, they're not infected or infectious. Thank you very much, Dr. Brown. So there's another question from a parent. She said, my 12-year-old son was due to have his vaccine 
But because my daughter had COVID and he was a close contact, I rang up the immunization service and they told me he shouldn't have the vaccine after I had consented. Are you going back to into schools to do it? So, so, so yes, there are mop-up sessions being planned for schools. Um, I think the exact arrangements will be different for each school, depending on how many students uh, there are to catch up. Uh, but what I would say is that, um, you know, you can take that into your own hands and you can, you can book them in um, at, at, at the Mountain Heights Centre uh, and get them vaccinated sooner without having to, to wait for that. So I'd encourage you to do that. Um, we also have uh, access uh, to free taxi journeys to and from the vaccination sites as well. Uh, from, from your home in Bedford to a vaccination site in Bedford through the council. Um, so if you look on the council's COVID web pages there, there's, there's links to that, how you can do that. So if you're, you know, that, that's a way to get to the vaccine sites very easily, uh, if that is a challenge. Thank you, Dr. Brandt. Do you also want to talk a little bit more about how long they need to wait in case they need to, they want to go to the vaccination site? Yes, so I think in this case, there's no need to wait because the, the, the daughter is only a contact of a case. So there's not a requirement to wait a certain period of time if she hasn't had COVID herself. Uh, but her, her, her uh, sorry, sorry, the son was due to have his, wasn't it? Sorry. So the son was due to have his vaccine, but he was a close contact. So there's no need in that particular set of circumstances to wait. But if you have a child who has had COVID-19 recently, uh, then you have to wait 28 days from the date of their test or the date that their symptoms started whichever is sooner, uh, 28 days from then before, before, you, uh, before you get the jab. Uh, thank you for that. There was another question around if the child has already had COVID and the child is healthy, uh, should the child still have the vaccine again? I, mean, I know you've answered that question, but maybe Dr. Naya, do you want yes. to still say a bit so, about that? Yeah, so if you catch COVID, it will give you some good protection. No doubt about that. Your own natural immunity will respond to the virus. But the problem is that immunity will start waning. Now, we don't know quite, and it varies between individuals, but that natural immunity from that infection may go after maybe two, three months. And so you'll be back to where you were and more exposed. So therefore, we do recommend if you've had COVID, wait 28 days, but then after 28 days onwards, go and have your vaccine because your natural immunity will work, will vein uh, and it won't be enough uh, to sustain afterwards. Thank you. So there's also another question um, about children. So this one is, can children get nosebleeds after COVID? So what they can get is rhinitis, so inflammation of the, of the nasal passages and in children, they're very quick at getting nosebleeds. So yes, if they've, they've got lots of catarrh and mucus, that can cause nosebleeds as well. Uh, so it can, yes, be part of that. So there's a follow-up question again about children having COVID. So the question is, if children have already had COVID and had it mildly, how likely is it that A, they will catch it again and B, it will be any worse? So it's really hard to predict, I'm afraid. That's the problem. Everyone is uh, so individual. It's your own immune system's reaction to that virus. Uh, and you just can't predict what kind of response your immune system has had. Uh, so it's hard to, to answer that. And so, yes, they can get reinfected. Uh, depends on the reaction to that first, react, uh, first infection. Thank you very much. So there's, there's a question about link between the vaccine and issues with fertility. Now, I'm going to ask both of you to contribute to that question. So is there a link between the vaccine and issues relating to fertility? So absolutely not. There is no link between this vaccine. And to my knowledge, and Ian maybe will also correct, I have no knowledge of any vaccine causing fertility issues. So I can categorically say no to that. Ian? I would agree with you. Um, so yes, there's no evidence at all that this vaccine affects fertility for women or for men. Um, and there have been now some studies that have looked at this. So for example, um, they've compared um, the egg quality, uh, ovarian follicle quality 
in, in women uh, who have been vaccinated compared to those who have been not been vaccinated, and there is absolutely no difference. Um, there were concerns that perhaps the spike protein could attach to the placenta and cause problems. That has now been conclusively proven not to be the case. And um, it's also clear that there's no difference in the rate of embryo implantation in the, uh, in the womb. Um, so they've compared that uh, in women who have been undergoing IVF, and they've been comparing the rate of embryo implantation before and after COVID vaccination, and there is no difference at all. And studies looking at male fertility have looked at, look, looked at sperm quality and sperm motility, so the ability of the sperm to swim in the right direction and total sperm count. And again, in samples taken before and after vaccination, they see no differences whatsoever. So, so not only is there no um, historical precedent for vaccines uh, leading to fertility issues, there's absolutely no evidence to support that for this particular vaccine. Uh, thank you very much. I, that is really very clear. And also there are links uh, to more information about um, COVID vaccine and fertility. And I can ask my colleague to put some of the links in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nye and Dr. Brown. So going on, we have uh, a number of questions now. Um, there is one here and I would say maybe it's a true or false because it says BBC News Article 6 Article six days ago stated that individuals who have had their two injections can be just as infectious as those who haven't had their two injections. I think Dr. Naya, you already said a bit about this. Do you want to? Do you no, so that? the studies that have been looking at transmission have found that the rates of transmission are reduced uh, if you've been double vaccinated. Thank you. Dr. Brown, do you want to say anything to that as well? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. So I think the study that, that, that was mentioned there looked at the vaccination rate uh, or the, the transmission rate in households where one or both of the people were already vaccinated. And, and as Dr. Nayar said, um, whilst it was still possible to transmit in the household, and we know that particularly this Delta variant uh, is incredibly transmissible, and everything that we assumed about how effective the vaccines were going to be you know, has changed as a result of it. But what we did still see was, though, the chance of a person in the household passing it to another one was lower if they were vaccinated than if they weren't vaccinated. So it did reduce it. Um, so so the, some of the headlines around that article have not been uh, particularly um, uh, representative of the study findings. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Um, so there's another one, and I'll ask Dr. Naya to take this one. So the parent is concerned about a 12-year-old son who is underweight and um, just about four and a half stone. So it, it, the, the parent said, as his weight is only that of a primary school age child, is it safe for him to have the vaccine? And there's also reference to vaccinating children in, in the US and also concern about the dose that is being given to maybe such uh, children. So in the States, the, their authorities have licensed the Pfizer vaccine now to, to younger groups, uh, but there will be some dose adjustments for that. Now, in this specific child's case, I would answer for that specific child, actually. I think that's something that for that individual case should uh, just seek advice from their general practitioner uh, because there might be some other uh, associated factors there. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm going to pass on that, I think for that specific uh, situation, need to seek advice from the from their general practitioner, please. Thank you for that. Um, so I think the next one is about lateral flow. Uh, maybe also maybe Ian, I would ask Ian to ask uh, that question and maybe just talk generally about what people should be doing now with regards to testing. So it said, can children do lateral flow tests if they have had COVID in the last few weeks? Yeah, so, so we don't advise that. Uh, they can do them, of course, and um, it's not such a strict rule as it is with uh, the PCR test. So we say, we say, please don't do another PCR test if you've had COVID in the last 90 days. Uh, and that's because um, even after, long after you uh, stop being infectious, some people will still shed bits of viral material that aren't live virus, but nonetheless get picked up in the PCR test. Now, the lateral flow test works in a different way and detects the virus in a different way. Uh, so there isn't that same problem about post-infectiousness, but we do expect, as, as Dr. Nair has already said, that people 
have, will have a degree of immunity for a period of months after they've been infected by COVID-19. So there is little value really in testing somebody with a lateral flow test um, after uh, they've had a period of infection. So we expect people to be infectious for, for 14 days. And after that time, uh, we, we, all the data says that you're no longer a risk to other people. So there's really, there's really no uh, need to keep uh, lateral flow testing after, the, after that time. And as I say, we would, in terms of our advice, for example, that we've given to schools where we're asking for uh, children who are household contacts with a positive case to lateral flow test uh, on a daily basis, we are excluding those children who have had a positive COVID test in the last 90 days from that advice for that reason. And um, just more generally, it's, if it's helpful for you in terms of um, our advice at the moment. So our advice for adults um, it, it, and for children who are secondary school age uh, is to be testing themselves twice weekly with a, with a rapid test. Um, also, I think it's worth using them as well. So for example, as an adult, if you are, or, and for your children, if you're visiting a vulnerable relative, uh, then it's good to do a lateral flow test before you go, I think, because that could just pick up an infection uh, before you uh, see somebody who's vulnerable. The great thing about lateral flow tests is they, they pick up the infections when you are most infectious. PCR tests are very, very sensitive, but they will pick up um, uh, COVID-19 long after you stop being infectious. So the, the lateral flow tests are really good uh, to be used regularly. Uh, they're very easy and very quick to do, obviously, as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, so there's a question here around support for those who might be anxious. So there's a parent that said that um, he or she was actually anxious before getting his or her vaccine, and now it's the turn of the child. Is there any kind of support for those who may be anxious for the child for their children? Can I ask Dr. Naya to? Yeah. So the. the the, our vaccinators are, are well trained uh, in dealing with uh, all kinds of situations and especially if uh, we expect people to be anxious and so forth. So uh, really the, the key thing is to tell when you arrive or having that vaccine, tell the person who is going to be in the vaccine about anxiety and then they'll take steps to help with that anxiety, reduce that, you know, take more time and so forth and, and be able to talk and and, and help with, with kind of calming down measures as well uh, before giving the vaccine. So they, they are, they're well trained with, with dealing with children and giving vaccines to children. Um, and, and so they will be able to help in that situation. The important thing is to tell them beforehand uh, so they can be prepared. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And I think there's support for those who might be anxious as well. And I would ask my colleagues to also put a, a kind of email link and also email address that people can actually contact if they are anxious about getting the COVID vaccine. Thanks, Dr. Naya. And um, so there's a question for you still, Dr. Naya, because this, I think, is clinical. Um, mm -hmm. So it's about the, the children are 12 and 14, and they are being tested annually for HCM, which has always been clear. And um, they've been told to have two doses, but the parent is wondering why they should um, and how safe that is if they've actually not been confirmed to be a case of HCM. Dr. Naya. Yeah, I, I, I did quite understand that question. Can... So yeah, so I think the person used HCM. I'm also not very clear about it. Um, so, I, but I, suspect this is quite clinical and perhaps the person should see their GP? I mean, for specific conditions like that, please seek advice from your GP. Uh, I don't want to be giving wrong information uh, in that situation. Okay, thank you. So there's one about adult vaccination. So it says around adult vaccinations, when is the booster available for adults age 30? Also, once someone is being vaccinated, is it going to be a yearly thing with these vaccinations? Uh, maybe I could answer that one. Um, yes. So um, the, the, the JCVI who makes, who, who advises the government on vaccine programmes, uh, they're currently only advising for over 50s, health and social care workers, and people with, who, are, who are more vulnerable to COVID-19. So younger people who have got additional vulnerabilities. So at the moment, uh, there is no recommendation to uh, provide a booster dose to somebody in their 30s or indeed somebody in their 40s like me. Um, I think 
the government and the JCVI will be looking at the data very closely though, because the information that's coming out of countries that started their booster campaigns early, like Israel, is showing it to be extremely effective. And it is, it is really uh, boosting uh, the immune response and, 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 and the efficacy of the vaccine uh, far greater uh, than, than two, vaccine, two vaccine doses do. So I think governments are looking very closely at whether or not it should be rolling out the booster programme to, to younger groups as well. And sorry, there was a second half of the part to the question, wasn't there? Yeah, so the, 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 so there's, yeah, there's another aspect to the question. So it's about, is it going to be a yearly thing? Again, I think the government is going to be looking very closely at uh, information it's collecting on um, antibody waning. Um, so they're collecting regular information from, a, from national sample surveys, uh, looking at the, the levels of COVID antibodies in people's blood as a marker for how effective their immune response is likely to be to a COVID-19 infection. So we need to understand, uh, particularly after the booster dose, uh, what that, uh, how fast that waning is as to how often um, the uh, future doses might need to be. I think it's highly likely uh, that it will become a, an annual uh, booster vaccine in the same way that it is uh, currently for flu. But again, I suspect like flu, once we've got uh, a level of uh, immunity in the population from natural infection and from vaccine-induced infection as well, that it may well just be more vulnerable groups, older people who, 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 are, who are asked to have that annual uh, booster. Again, I think the other factor that we'll need to consider is uh, the effect of variants and new variants and whether or not the, uh, the vaccines that we have already remain effective or whether or not that formula needs to be tweaked to be more um, effective with, with, with new variants over time. Thank you very much, Dr. Brand. So there's a question about um, those who are double vaccinated and I'll ask Dr. Naya to take that question. So the question is how come people who have been double vaccinated still get COVID? Because the vaccine isn't going to be 100% effective. The purpose of the vaccine is to prevent you getting severely ill from COVID, prevent you going to hospital and from dying, but it doesn't prevent you from getting a milder illness. So if you're double vaccinated, hopefully you won't catch it at all, but if you do catch it, it's gonna be a mild illness for you and it will reduce your chance of getting long-term consequences of that COVID. But it's not 100%, no vaccine is 100%. But this vaccine actually is more effective than many we've got. It's certainly more effective than the flu vaccine we, we use every year. It's a good vaccine, but it's not going to be 100%. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Naya. So there's a question here around um, once I've had the vaccine, do I stop wearing masks? Dr. Brown? I think oh, yeah. for, for the reasons that... Uh, Dr. Naya has just explained, um, people who have had two doses of the vaccine can still catch COVID. Uh, often it's much more mild as a result of having the vaccine and, it, and, and, and people clear the, clear the infection much quicker, but they can still be infectious <clears throat> and they can still pass it on. So for me, it's really, really important. And, and I'm, I'm double jabbed. I still wear my mask when, I, when I'm in indoor public spaces. Uh, I'm still being cautious. I'm still lateral flow testing when I'm when I'm meeting up with work colleagues, when I'm meeting up with family members who are outside of my household. So I think it's what we have to think of it like is a vaccine plus strategy. So the vaccines are effective, but they are not the only thing we need to do if we want to bring this uh, pandemic to an end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Brown. And um, so we don't have any more questions in the chat box and um, if you have questions, please still put your questions in there. I'll just uh, do some final reminders uh, before I give the floor again to Dr. Brown and Dr. Naya to make their final statement. Just to thank everyone again for joining. And if you have questions, please put in the chat box or you can send it to uh, the email that my colleague will put in the chat box as well. To, uh, where you can get answers to any questions you may have. So I'll just ask my colleague to uh, put the different messages in the chat box to everyone so they can have access to the information. We're also going to put link to a survey in the chat box as well. And that is to give us feedback about 
the, today's um, webinar and, and also um, what we can do differently or better next time. And also if you have any other comments, you have opportunity to actually let us know through the survey. So please, the link is in the chat box, help us to um, fill that survey, the questionnaire, and uh, we would take every feedback into consideration. So thank you very much. And at, at this point, I'm going to ask Dr. Brown and Dr. Naya to give us their final statement. I will call on Dr. Naya first, thank you. So uh, again, thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, the take home messages are that I'm afraid we can't be complacent with COVID still. We still need to take all the precautions we've been talking about. And actually the vaccine is our best way of, of getting back to any semblance of normality that we can. Uh, and we know that the rates are highest with the children. So let's get our children vaccinated. It's a safe vaccine for them. There will be individual cases. And I understand, you know, any parent giving a, uh, anything to a child is going to be worried about that. Uh, so if there are specific instances, if your child, for example, like we've heard, underweight or has epilepsy or you know, screening for um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and all those other things, please seek the advice of your general practitioner who can help you and guide you with that decision making. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Really appreciate your time this evening. Uh, Dr. Brown. Thank you. Um, I don't have much more to add, but what I, I would say is that I, I hope this has been helpful. Um, it's not always possible to give a huge amount of detail in these answers, uh, but if people would like more detail on some of the studies that we've mentioned and some of the numbers uh, behind them, um, we'd be very happy to share that information and we can do that through the, through the uh, email address that uh, I think has been provided in the chat already or certainly, certainly will be. Um, I would encourage you all to talk to your, to your children, young people about this and, and, and understand their, their, their concern and how they feel about it. I, I hope that you're able to make an informed decision um, together as a family. Um, and I, I hope that this has helped. And I, yeah, I support everything that Dr. Myers said. That the vaccines are a critical way out of this. Uh, we need to keep, we need to get our vaccination rates up as high as we can in all the eligible groups. And we are still going after those people who, those adults who have not had their first dose as well, because um, they are still at risk. And it's important as well that we follow the advice around face coverings and crowded spaces. Uh, we use lateral flow tests. They're free, they're easy, uh, and they're a great way of allowing us to get back to normal um, and, and meet other people and do the things that we love. Um, so I, I would just encourage you all to do that, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, there's, I think there's a last question here. So maybe we take it in the last one to two minutes. So it's about how do you identify the vulnerable people um, in terms of the, getting the vaccine? Say I myself had brain surgery to remove a tumor years back, although I still have a few issues. I wasn't eligible to have the vaccine early, although I have not had my vaccine. So it's about how do you identify vulnerable people, Dr. Nair? So we follow the guidelines in the uh, green book, we call it, the immunization guide, uh, which has a list of uh, conditions that are deemed kind of more clinically vulnerable. Uh, and that's information we use. Again, if, if you're not sure, go to your, uh, there's information on the website, but you can always seek advice from your GP. You can also, uh, and, uh, and if they think actually, yes, you are more clinically vulnerable, they can actually help you with that, uh, help you to get that vaccine. Thank you, thank you so much. So thank you everyone once again. Thank you, Dr. Naya, thank you, Dr. Brown. Thank you everyone for joining this evening's meeting. As it, uh, it has been stated at the beginning, we would put the recording on the council's website and also, if you have further questions, please do not hesitate to write to public.health at bedford.gov.uk. And if you need more information, you can go to the blmkccg.nhs.uk slash COVID-19 website, and you would be able to find more answers to different questions that you may have. So thank you once again for joining, and don't forget to fill our so our questionnaire in the survey link that has been posted 
Have a lovely evening and thank you.